You're listening to an Ono Media Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. And you know what? Happy New Year. Now, if you can't tell, I am a little sick. I definitely got a Christmas cold and it just won't leave. But I have something more important to tell you than about my Christmas cold. And that is that there are going to be some changes coming to Binged this year year. We've been working on this for a while and I'm going to give you a little backstory as to why we're even doing this. So let's rewind to last year, 2023. It's January. I have been prepping for Binged since October of 2022, probably even before that. I recorded episodes, scrapped them, recorded episodes, scrapped them. I just couldn't find the flow that I was wanting for this individual show. And then January came around and it was time for launch day. And I was like, you know what? I'll just figure it out as I go. I kind of like where we're starting. um, And as the time goes on and I can put more energy into it, it will eventually become what it is. I mean, if you come from my other show, Murder With My Husband, it has drastically changed since the first episode because we just trusted the process. We just went in being ourselves and it turned into what it is. And so I went in with that same mindset going into Binged. And then the first week of January, 2023, I had basically a severe mental break. I started having panic attacks daily. Um, It threw me for a really big loop. It landed me in the ER multiple times and it was all mental. It was all mental health stuff and um, it was life-changing to say the least. And although things have gotten so much better since, it made it so I could not focus on binged or murder with my husband literally until about six months into the year. A lot of the weight fell on Garrett's shoulders. I really pulled back from work to focus on me. And because of that, binged kind of spiraled into something that I didn't intend for it to be. And I've always known that if I am going to put out a solo show, I want it to be 100% authentic and me. And like I feel how murder with my husband is and binge just ended up not being that on my end. Now, if you love Binged, that's great, but I want to be proud of what I'm putting out. And so I've decided with the new year, you know what? It's my show. Um, I want to be proud of the content that I'm creating. And so I am going to be basically revamping binged, if you will. And it's not going to change drastically. I am going to change the name and the cover art. So that will be coming shortly. I just didn't want to drop it on you guys. So expect in the next coming weeks that binged looks a little bit different. It's still binged. It is still true crime. We are done with the themes, but I'm also kind of exploring a little bit more into the dark as well. Maybe once a month or once every other month, I will explore a conspiracy theory of sort or a haunting of sort. Maybe not something that completely surrounds murder. I have loved true crime and all things spooky since I can remember, and I really, really want this show to emulate that. So coming up next week, this show will be called Into the Dark with Peyton Moreland. It is essentially binged. Do not fret. Do not be confused. I needed to do this for me. This is primarily so I can feel proud of the content that I'm giving you guys. Um, And I just want it to reflect more of who I am. And so please bear with me and have patience as I take this journey. I know that binge has kind of been up and down over the last year, but to be frank, my life has been up and down over the last year. And so It's just kind of riding the wave with me and I'm ready for this new fresh start and it's still true crime. It's still me, Peyton Moreland, telling you the story, but I hope it kind of emulates more of what Murder With My Husband is and less of what Binged became for me. That being said, 
we are going to start this episode with Peyton's 10 seconds. And if you come over from Murder With My Husband, you know that my husband has a little 10 seconds on there that he can talk about whatever. And we've been highly requested to do this over here on Binged or Into the Dark. And so here we go. My first 10 seconds of 2024. Um, I had a bit of a relapse, if you will, into my attacks um, starting in December. And it's because this is a crazy month. You have to go see family. There's so much going on. I got sick. And honestly, it's just been a little bit harder to make it through the day to day. So my 10 seconds today is if you are one of those people, if you are getting bogged down by whatever, whatever is happening in your life, just know there is light at the end of the tunnel. I am here with you and you deserve happiness. You deserve fullness. You deserve light. You deserve love. And I'm here with you trying my best to create that for my life. So peace to everyone and peace to me as we move forward. And with that, let's jump into the episode. Trigger warning, this episode includes discussions of domestic assault, the sexual assault of a minor, and murder. Please listen with care. So there's a famous adage coined by film producer Robert Evans that says, there are three sides to every story, my side, your side, and the truth. The idea being that people can be self-serving when they tell you about their lives. Even if we're not intentionally lying about our experiences and our feelings, we might subconsciously reframe our role in certain events to better fit with the idea of who we'd like to be. Now, one would hope that wouldn't happen during a murder case. Ideally, when someone is killed, the police will conduct a thorough investigation and produce evidence that clearly shows who did it, how, and why. But nobody can know what's going on in another person's mind. When it comes to questions like the killer's motive, sometimes we can only make educated guesses based on our observations of their behavior. Or we can ask the culprit while taking a huge grain of salt because, like I said, they may not tell us the truth. After all, there are three sides to every story. If you're watching on YouTube, Daisy just decided to join the party, so she's here now. But back to the story. Our case is surrounding a man named Jeremy Barron, and the evidence seemed to paint a pretty clear narrative. In 2017, he was 37 years old and he'd been arrested numerous times and charged with a variety of crimes. They ranged from driving with an open container to serious violent offenses. He lived in the small city of Hillsdale, Michigan, a cozy Midwestern community with a population of about 8,000 people. But behind the historic houses and the picturesque campus of Hillsdale College, the city offered plenty of opportunities for people to get into trouble should they go looking for it. In February that year, Jeremy was arrested for one count of criminal sexual conduct involving a minor under the age of 16. And I'm not sure about the details of this case, but Jeremy and his family members insisted the charge was false. He even consented to take a lie detector test to try and prove his innocence. His girlfriend, who, for the record, was not the victim in the sexual conduct case, paid his bail to secure his release on February 6, 2016. And a few days later, Jeremy Barron just dropped off the map. It's hard to say if anyone was alarmed or even if they noticed when Jeremy disappeared. None of his friends or family members reported him missing. Apparently, Jeremy had a history of taking off for weeks at a time without staying in contact with anyone, so many of his loved ones figured this was just Jeremy being Jeremy. No need to raise the alarm. In fact, Jeremy could be so uncommunicative, many of his loved ones didn't even realize he'd been charged with a serious crime. 
But given that he was still waiting to stand trial for those sexual conduct charges, the police were keeping close tabs on him, especially when he failed to show up for his first trial date. So he gets out on bail by his girlfriend and then he just goes missing and no one really reports it, but then his first trial date shows up and he doesn't appear. It seemed the police's first conclusion was that he'd just skipped town. So police launched a massive search to try to find the alleged predator. They released his photo on a wanted poster on February 22nd. It said he was now being charged with four counts of a failure to appear in court. The police behaved as though he'd disappeared on purpose, as if he was still healthy and alive somewhere. He was just on the run and they just had to find him. But if anyone actually knew what had happened to Jeremy, you'd think it would be that on again, off again girlfriend, Ashley Hoth. She's the woman I referenced earlier who paid for Jeremy's bail. Ashley and Jeremy had begun dating in or before 2016. Before that point, Ashley had a hard life. She began abusing alcohol as a teenager and started using meth when she was just 20 years old. When she met Jeremy, she had three children from previous relationships. And when they got together, theirs was hardly a happily ever after love story. Later, Ashley alleged that Jeremy was violently abusive. On one occasion in July of 2016, he struck and choked Ashley while two of her children watched in horror. Another time, he broke her rearview mirror. Again, this corroborated by Ashley's children who witnessed the incident. Ashley also complained to her friends that Jeremy was possessive and controlling and wouldn't let her leave the house. When she eventually lost custody of her children, she cited his domestic abuse as a reason. Afterward, Ashley frequently told her loved ones that she held Jeremy responsible for her kids being removed from her care. However, it's hard to say how valid that claim was. While Jeremy's violence certainly didn't contribute to a stable environment, Ashley's drug use made her neglectful. At least once, one of her children almost drowned because Ashley let them play by a lake unsupervised while she took a nap. And there were other incidents where she failed to provide proper care, which had nothing to do with Jeremy. Plus, some evidence even suggested that Ashley was the abusive one, or at least that she and Jeremy were both abusing each other. She was arrested and charged with domestic assault on more than one occasion as well, including one incident where she tried to run someone over with her car. Once again, this was in full view of her poor children. And allegations suggest that Ashley once beat her sister, Jolene, until Jolene passed out. Now, before I go on, I do want to pause here and note that domestic abuse can be complicated. There's a popular maxim that it's important to believe women, and I don't want to undermine any victims of domestic or sexual assault who struggle to come forward. But it's possible for a person to be a victim in one context and an aggressor in the next. And it's important to realize that a person doesn't have to be perfect to be deserving of sympathy and support. Some women are violent, impulsive, and dangerous to the people around them, all while still being victims of domestic assault themselves. We can't work out the specifics of who was more in the wrong between Ashley and Jeremy, at least not their relationship as it existed prior to his disappearance. But there seems to be abundant evidence that the couple was toxic, and both people could have been simultaneously in danger and a danger to one another. However, they weren't together anymore as of February 2017, Ashley hadn't heard from Jeremy since his disappearance, since she bailed him out of jail. And nearly two full months passed before anyone uncovered a clue about where he'd gone. On Sunday, April 2nd, 2017, a group of four Amish boys were horseback riding in a wooded area outside of Hillsdale. Early in the afternoon, one boy spotted pants and shoes peeking through the vegetation near their trail. 
Initially, the boys weren't sure what they were looking at. One thought someone had discarded their clothing, while another assumed they'd stumbled onto a mannequin or some other inanimate figure. But when they took a closer look, they realized they'd discovered a decomposing dead man. The boys ran off for help, and by 3.52 p.m., the police were investigating what they believed to be a crime scene. And I have to wonder, the Amish don't have cell phones, so how long did it take for them to find a phone to call police? But that's just my brain wondering. When a medical examiner looked at the remains, they confirmed the officer's suspicions. This man had died of five gunshot wounds. He'd clearly been murdered. Police still had to identify the body, so they began by searching missing persons reports. There were no hits on that front, but they were able to match the body with a wanted man who'd missed multiple court dates about two months prior. And you already know who this is, Jeremy Barron. Apparently, he didn't really just skip out on his trial. Instead, he was a victim of homicide. Right away, the detectives turned their attention to Jeremy's sometimes girlfriend, Ashley Hoth. It's unclear exactly what put her on their radar as a person of interest, but once they began digging into her behavior since the disappearance, they uncovered some disturbing facts. The most damning piece of evidence may have been security camera footage that was recorded while Ashley worked her job at a fast food joint. Apparently, Someone visited her at work to discuss the fact that her ex-boyfriend's body had recently been found, that ex-boyfriend that she had bailed out of jail and then no one had seen again. The security cameras recorded Ashley replying, saying something like, I was there when the guy shot him and you don't want to know who it is because he's done it before and got away with it. Assuming this was anything more than bluster, it sounded like Ashley not only knew who killed Jeremy, but she'd witnessed it with her own eyes. At least this is what she's telling a coworker on security camera. So on April 9th, just one week after Jeremy's body was found, the police called Ashley in for an interrogation. Initially, Ashley maintained that she was innocent and didn't seem to realize why she was being questioned. She began describing the terrible abuse she suffered at Jeremy's hands, but didn't let on that she had any information about the circumstances of Jeremy's death. The detectives encouraged her to keep the conversation moving those lines. They asked her about her struggles to leave him and even probed Ashley about whether she thought Jeremy had encouraged her abuse of controlled substances. Ashley went along with detectives' suggestions, unwittingly helping to establish a potential motive for the murder. She discussed all the reasons she'd benefited from having Jeremy out of her life. When the police revealed that they'd seen the security tape, the one where Ashley admitted to knowing who killed Jeremy, everything in this interrogation changed. <laughs> she burst into tears, and didn't stop crying for the entire rest of the interrogation. While her sobs heaved through her whole body, Ashley confirmed that the fast food security footage was accurate. She could barely get out more than a sentence or two before dissolving into tears again, but the police patiently pressed for more information. She said she was present for Jeremy's murder, but she didn't pull the trigger herself. When the detectives asked Ashley to name the real killer, she initially refused to answer. That is, until the police revealed that they'd already identified him. Talk about dropping a bomb. It was a man who'd become very close with Ashley in the past few months, reportedly to a point of obsession a violent criminal with a history named Jay Clark. Ashley confirmed that, yeah, their conclusion was right. Her friend, who is obsessed with her, Jay, killed Jeremy while she was present. Now, Jay and Ashley had only become friends fairly recently. They met at a bar in late 2016, just months before Jeremy's murder. 
That night, Ashley griped about Jeremy's possessive, controlling tendencies and mused that the only way to get rid of him was to kill him. Later, Ashley would claim she was just venting. She didn't mean it. But clearly, Jay took her words deadly seriously. When she said she needed to get rid of Jeremy, Jay replied, that can happen. After that night, Jay and Ashley became very close very rapidly. While they insisted that there was nothing romantic or sexual about their relationship, outside observers thought Jay seemed obsessed with Ashley. But when police questioned Jay, he said that he was just concerned about Ashley and wanted to help her get her life back on track. Jay knew that Ashley blamed Jeremy for her children being taken away, and just like Ashley had said to him the night they met, Jay decided he needed to remove Jeremy from Ashley's life for her safety. Ashley told the police that on February 8th, 2017, she, Jay, and Jeremy were all hanging out together, drinking and playing games. This was the first time Jay and Jeremy ever met one another. It's worth noting that this was just two days after Ashley bailed Jeremy out of jail for the criminal sexual conduct arrest. If she was really as afraid of Jeremy as she said, it's hard to understand why she even helped him get from behind bars, which is an important point that I'll be coming back to later. Anyway, Ashley told a couple different versions of what happened next. We see this all the time with people. Either the trio decided to see if they could score some drugs or Jeremy lost his phone and Jay and Ashley offered to drive around and help him find it. Whatever the reason, they all piled into Jay's Chevy Tahoe and drove off into the woods. Ashley said she didn't know what Jay had planned. At one point, Jay turned to Jeremy and asked if he'd promise to never hurt Ashley again. So they're all in the car and superhero Jay, who barely knows Ashley and has just met Jeremy, turns to him and says, hey, promise me you'll never hurt Ashley again. But Jeremy, who's fresh out of jail and Ashley's his ex on and off again girlfriend, refused to respond to Jay. So Jay turned his attention to Ashley at this point and said, get her done, inflecting it like a question. In her confession, Ashley said she didn't really know what Jay was asking, but she agreed anyway. She told him, get her done. Apparently, Jay took this as permission. He pulled out his gun and he shot Jeremy. Ashley told police she was too shocked to do anything but cry Jeremy's name over and over again as he died in front of her. Afterward, Jay destroyed the evidence of the crime, burning the backseat of the car to eliminate any DNA. Ashley helped him, but she insisted that Jay never forced her to commit or cover up the homicide. While she was terrified and made some bad choices in a moment of panic, they were all her own choices, which she made freely. Still, immediately after the murder, Ashley was freaked out. She went to her sister Jolene's house to ask for advice, but nobody answered when she pounded on her door. As for why she didn't come forward earlier, Ashley said she was just scared. If Jay could kill Jeremy so easily, he might come after her next. On the strength of Ashley's confession, the authorities issued a warrant for Jay's arrest. He was drunk when they apprehended him, too inebriated to consent to an interrogation. He also had meth in his possession, which later led to controlled substance charges. The detectives waited for him to sober up, then they sat Jay down in the interrogation room. He initially denied everything, just like Ashley had. That is, until the police told him that Ashley had already implicated him, they'd already talked to her, she had confessed, and suddenly Jay's story changed. Now he told them, whatever she said is what happened. Now he didn't even know what she'd said about him at this point. He couldn't know what he was agreeing to when he offered a blanket confession that she was right. And police weren't satisfied with such a generic admission. They kept the questioning going. Later, Jay agreed that he did kill Jeremy. He claimed he and Jeremy were alone in the Chevy Tahoe at the time of the shooting. Ashley wasn't there for the murder and couldn't possibly know anything about it. He also said that when he burned the car seat to cover up the crime, he was alone and he did it all without her help. But the police told him 
Ashley's already admitted that she was present for both the murder and the seat burning. Once he realized this, Jay once again changed his story to be consistent with Ashley's confession. It seemed at this point like Jay was covering for Ashley, so it was really hard to say where the truth really lay. Especially because Ashley and Jay weren't only fudging details with the police, they apparently misled each other and other people they knew. In that fast food security camera clip, Ashley warned her acquaintance that the man who killed Jeremy had committed other murders before. And police learned from other witnesses that Jay was allegedly a former hitman. But when they asked Jay about his reportedly murderous past, he denied it all. He said he'd lied to Ashley after Jeremy's homicide. It was an attempt to look like he wasn't bothered by the crime he'd committed. It seems Ashley believed him because the day after the murder, she called her sister Jolene to say she was terrified of a man who might try to hurt her. Ashley didn't say the man's name, but she did tell Jolene he'd killed multiple people before. So it seems like this was a clear reference to Jay. But since no one could keep their story straight, police turned their attention away from the eyewitnesses and toward forensics, which you have to do at this point. As it turned out, the ballistics evidence told a completely different story. One that didn't match Jay or Ashley's confessions. Like I mentioned before, Jeremy died of five bullet wounds. Four of the injuries were on his left side, while the fifth projectile hit him from the right. The wound on his right side also seemed to come from a bullet that was smaller than the four others. This suggested someone shot him multiple times from the left. If Jeremy was sitting in the rear passenger seat of the truck, a person in the driver's seat could hit him at the right trajectory to match the wounds on the left side of his body. Meanwhile, a second shooter would have had to fire at least one shot from the right. Now in both Ashley and Jay's confessions, they mentioned that Jay only fired three to four times. If they were lying, it's unclear why they didn't come up with a cover story that could account for that fifth bullet. And there were also indications that Ashley and Jay weren't being forthright about when they killed Jeremy or dumped the body. Jay said that right after he murdered Jeremy, again back on February 8th, he just opened the car door and let the body tumble out onto the ground. He drove away then tried to destroy all the evidence of the homicide inside the car. He burned the seat Jeremy had been killed in and tried to melt the murder weapon with a blowtorch. Or maybe he tossed it into a camper's sewage tank. Either way, he confessed to destroying the gun all of those ways during different interrogations. Later, he removed the Tahoe's back seat entirely and traded the vehicle for another. Maybe he hoped police wouldn't trace the truck from its new owner to him. Now, that last bit of testimony is likely true. Police did eventually find the Chevy Tahoe and confirmed it had no back seat. They also managed to track down the burnt husk of the seat to some property owned by Jay's mother and stepfather. But the part about dumping Jay's body in the woods didn't match the evidence. While his corpse was heavily decomposed when it was discovered, it didn't have certain specific damage you'd expect if it had been lying in the woods for two whole months. A medical examiner was unable to find any evidence that animals had scavenged the remains. This left two possibilities. Either Jeremy was killed shortly before his body was discovered, or Ashley and Jay stored his corpse elsewhere, then eventually dumped it in the woods in April. The first scenario didn't seem super likely, as no one can explain where Jeremy was between February and April if he was still alive. Plus, there were no tire tracks near his body. If someone had driven the remains through the woods in early April, they'd leave some kind of sign showing they'd been there. However, authorities still couldn't rule this possibility out entirely. Later, the county's chief deputy coroner speculated that Jeremy might have been killed in February. Then, Jay and Ashley may have stashed his corpse in a garage or a shed or something before they moved it to that trail in the woods. It's unclear why they do that and why they continually asserted that they dumped his body the same day they killed him. We may never get a clear answer on that front. Either way, prosecutors decided they didn't fully believe Ashley and Jay's testimony. 
there were too many inconsistencies. So the state charged both with Jeremy's murder, assuming that Ashley might have been that second shooter. When it came time for Ashley to go on trial, she agreed to testify against Jay in exchange for lesser charges. Instead of being charged with conspiracy and open murder, which would allow the jury to convict her of either first or second degree murder, she'd plead guilty to second degree murder in late 2017. With this plea, Ashley also gave a new confession. This time, she admitted that she knew about the murder in advance and had helped plan it with Jay. She said that when she paid Jeremy's bail on February 6, 2016, she hoped that his brief stint behind bars would be a wake-up call, but she was wrong. Once again, Jeremy attacked her, and to defend herself, Ashley grabbed a gun. However, she couldn't bring herself to pull the trigger. Later, after she escaped to safety, she told Jay about everything that had happened, including her failed attempt to shoot Jeremy. Ashley said that was the moment she and Jay decided to plot the homicide. She was all in from the beginning. So on the first day of Jay's trial, January 10th, 2018, Ashley was called to the stand to share this story, but she showed up late. So much so that the court had to take an unplanned recess while they waited for her to arrive. Finally, Ashley walked into the courtroom, took the stand, and was sworn in. When she sat down, she seemed emotional and nervous, like she couldn't get comfortable in her seat. Then, before she could answer a single question, she turned to the judge and announced she wanted to withdraw her guilty plea. Now, that's not how plea bargains work. You can't change your plea while on the stand for another person's trial. The judge didn't let her do whatever it was she was attempting to do. But afterward, she refused to say a word under oath. Ashley claimed it was because she was afraid Jay would retaliate by hurting her kids. Which doesn't seem like a credible fear as Jay was in jail at this point and had no way to get to Ashley or her family. While Ashley didn't testify, prosecutors were still able to get some of her story out another way by talking to her sister Jolene. Jolene informed the court that she'd spoken with Ashley several times since the murder. In some of those conversations, Ashley said she knew the man who'd killed Jeremy, and at least once she admitted she'd also been involved in the killing as well. Jolene also explained that her sibling had a history of being less than truthful. Between her statements, the other witnesses, and the hard evidence, Jay's guilt was clear. The jury found him guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced him to life in prison. Later that month, Ashley attended her sentencing hearing. Prosecutors had initially scheduled it for after Jay's trial. They wanted to make sure she fulfilled her end of the plea bargain by testifying against him. This was a good call on their part, given her refusal to take the stand in Jay's trial. Even at the time of her sentencing, Ashley again tried to get her plea bargain overturned. She wanted to stand trial and try to convince a jury that she was guilty of a lesser charge, like manslaughter. But the courts weren't having it. Her guilty plea stood and the judge refused to give any credence to her arguments that she killed Jeremy because she was so scared of him. The judge noted if Ashley was really that intimidated, she could have just refused to pay his bail. Jeremy was no threat to her while he was in jail for his criminal sexual conduct charge. Instead, the judge suggested that Ashley was lying about everything, but still allowed her to get the lesser penalty associated with her second degree murder plea. She was sentenced to 25 to 50 years behind bars and is currently serving her term with the Michigan Department of Corrections. So the story ends with one alleged abuser dead and another in prison for murder, along with her violent co-conspirator, at least in some versions of the story. But this case is very complex, in part because every person of interest has their own perspective, which often contradicts the other. When Ashley confessed to police, she said she was afraid of both Jeremy and Jay. However, when Jay went to trial, his lawyer suggested the opposite was true, that Ashley had manipulated an otherwise peaceful, well-meaning man into committing murder for her. In that narrative, although Jay was a culprit, he was also Ashley's pawn, too. And this case is also complicated by the years of abuse Ashley said she faced at Jeremy's hands. It seems everyone in this story was a little bit at fault and a little bit of a victim too. So it's hard to draw clear lines around who's in the right or the wrong. Life is just full of shades of gray. 
One thing we can say for sure, Jeremy deserved better than what he got. Even if it's true that he was violent, controlling, and abusive, he still shouldn't have been extrajudicially shot in the head in the middle of the woods. He shouldn't have been left to rot for months undiscovered. The courts were clear on this point. Ashley was in no danger when she and Jay killed him. This wasn't self-defense. It was a cold-blooded murder. And I do have to note, his family insisted that for all of his faults and all of his violent history, Jeremy was a good man who maybe could have turned his life around if only he hadn't been killed. He helped his relatives around the house and genuinely cared about those closest to him. Even Ashley seemed to agree she went too far. At one point after her confession, she expressed remorse, saying that it was still hard for her to believe Jeremy was dead, even though she'd committed the murder herself. She kept expecting him to call her on the phone or drop by her place for a visit. It was so hard for her to accept that he was really gone for good. Now, there's room for skepticism around this statement, just like with everything else she said. But from the sound of it, Ashley may truly regret killing her ex-boyfriend. As for the rest of the questions surrounding the case, including the inconsistencies around the timeline, we may never get an answer. And we can still debate how trustworthy the answers we do have are. At the end of the day, we might not ever learn the truth, but we can try to read between the lines as we pick apart the various, often contradictory, sides of the story. Because again, there's three sides to every story. Your side, my side, and the truth. All right, you guys, that is it for this, maybe what I can just call new season of formally binged now into the dark with Peyton. Again, do not be shocked if your cover art changes, the logo changes, the name changes. It's still binged over here, as you can clearly see from this episode, but I'm really hoping that these episodes just get a little bit more meat, a little bit more me, and a little bit more spooky. Okay, I will see you next week as we travel further into the dark.